Hello, welcome to another Tonalist Landscape Oil Painting Demonstration. This is your painter in residence, M. Francis McCarthy. And the painting I'm bringing you today is called White's Beach. It's a beach out here in New Zealand. Uh, my painting is based on a um, Wiki Commons photo. Um, the, um, I don't know the photographer's name, but... Uh, uh, if you see me doing this painting, speak up and I'll be sure to give you some attribution. Um, I took quite a lot of liberties with this photo. And uh, if you want to have a gander at that reference, it's in the members area, as is a um, full, um, I think it might be truncated in this one, but most members area videos have my full initial color mixing session where I'm basically breaking down the painting into its constituent uh, color elements. Yeah, 10 to 14 colors, maybe less sometimes, depending on what's going on. And uh, and mixing those prior to starting the painting, just to kind of get my head wrapped around things. Um, so, several things I did that were different from the photo. You don't have the photo, but this whole mass that you see me working on there was, was maybe one-third smaller in the photo, so I enlarged it. The mass of hills in the background, I doubled easily doubled in size. At one point you could see I had an almost triple. I thought that was a little too far. Um, the ocean, uh, you know, in between the rocks, that water area, was a lot wider in the photo and just a bunch of nothing there. So I wanted to um, to squeeze that up a bit too. And then the uh, the sky, of course, I uh, it just had a blue sky in the photo, which was boring. So. Uh, not that I put anything super exciting in there, but it's got a little more interest uh, and something a little neutral, just some clouds with gray and white, you know, and uh, just to give a little more atmosphere and feeling. And the sky really is one of the primary places in your scene that you can inject feeling and emotion, um, and which you can then sort of extrapolate throughout the painting into the rest of the scene. So a lot of times I'll take my uh, sort of vanilla uh, reference photo, which might just be, you know, your regular silver grays and your cool greens, um, like almost any photo you take out here, uh, except for maybe summer, right? Um, and I start, uh, uh, first thing I'll do is maybe find myself a different sky. I have a big folder full of skies I've been collecting for 10, 12 years. Um, some of you uh, that are members actually know because I turned you on to the folder. But um, I take that and I'll find it. It, it might take a little while to find a cool, interesting sky that works with that scene. Um, a lot of times if I really, uh, you know, I'm, I'll take my color cues from that sky. So let's say we found a golden sunset. I might say, okay. I'm going to tilt the rest of the landscape into golden sunset territory. And uh, so that's part of my creative process there. And it really starts in the digital realm. Um, and some of you may know, or some of you may know, that I was a, a professional uh, commercial illustrator for 13 years. I did a lot of illustrations for the uh, national parks and San Diego Zoo and Starbucks and the department stores. I did all kinds of stuff, animals, dinosaurs monster trucks, icons, you know, like symbolic icons, not like celebrity icons, um, all kinds of things, whatever came down the pike, and uh, it was a great experience, um, and what it taught me was to uh, sort of finish things, sort of um, know when to change things, know when to modify things, um, and always when to in interject some creativity. So I was in the digital realm like all day long uh, to the point where I got, you know, was very enamored with digital um, uh, starting with uh, when I got my first uh, computer in uh, 94. Uh, and the reason I got it was to learn um, the programs and to learn Photoshop and to um, color my, uh, at that time I wasn't painting, I was doing mostly pen and ink work and uh, things like that. So um, I have a lot of aptitude with the digital realm, but even if you do not, there's a lot of things you could do to your reference photos. And um, the other caveat I want to stick in here is be careful who and what photos you um, you make paintings after. If it's a very famous photo or somebody's proprietary photo, like this was open for um, 
you know, not, um, you know, for people to use freely. Um, thank goodness, because <laughs> this painting came out really pretty hot. I think well, a cool or whatever you want to say. Um, it really. Uh, it, and one thing you'll notice about this painting is that. Actually, I should point out in the members area, it's like nearly four hours long with those uh, color mixing sessions and initial sessions where I'm talking about changes to the uh, composition and the reference. But uh, four good hours, really. And uh, one of the reasons it took a little extra time is because this mass you see me working on there, that that rocky out outcropping that's coming into the water with a very interesting little hole through it. Um, sometimes I, uh, towards the end of the painting, I had to kind of slow down a bit. And it wasn't like, um, in fact, this is something great to talk about. So, you know, you've got a little bump here, a little ridge there, you know, some little rocks here or there. You don't want to, and oh, this is, before I forget, um, these rocks in the foreground remind me to talk about that too, because there was a hundreds of more rocks. And in the past, I've become totally lost and totally messed up on that area and I won't say these are like award-winning rocks or that's an amazing part of the painting but it doesn't kill the painting it doesn't hurt the painting um, what can very easily happen with something like that in the foreground is you start painstakingly delineating and painting every rock from the photo reference um, and it just is going to fail miserably you might not even know because after you've got 10 hours in the painting you know you're a bit invested, right? Um, but at some point, if you keep painting, at some point in the future, you walk by that painting, you go, man, did I mess that up. I gotta find a better way. That's what's happened to me. I have another scene I'm working on too that's very similar. I thought this might be good kind of dry run for it because that, that scene is a beach scene, kind of like this, but with thousands more rocks. But I'm gonna work it out and you can see what I did here is if you go back a little bit to the drawing stage, you see where I started drawing some rocks and then you, I wiped it out with the paper towel. And that gave me a bit of a ghost image, which I kind of started refining the ghost image and not worrying so much about the reference. When it came time to paint, like when I painted in these little dark bits there, I would pull various bits from various details in the reference. However, my rocks are not the same at all. Some of them would resemble rocks that were in the reference, but they're not in the same places. And there's like, I don't know, easily one, one eighth the amount of rocks there. Um, so, and also I use them as a competition, competition, compositional tool to pull us up into that area. We're going to follow that white wave. The other thing I wanted to point out, compositional thing, you see that wave. Um, it's a very subtle, quiet kind of wave. Um, two things. One, I noticed there was like this definite like uh, raw umber tone that was right above the white part. Which, So when I painted that in and I painted the white over the top, it gave me an incredible realistic effect. So that's a tip for you. The other thing is in the photo reference, it was almost a completely um, straight diagonal line. So... I staggered it, I gave it um, a sort of a stair step kind of feeling, and that is a big tip for you. Those of you that have made it into the eight minute mark, welcome to the eight minute mark. And write this tip down. So strong diagonals in your painting are always, um, some people misinterpret me on this, that I won't do strong diagonals or that I don't like them. Um, that's not what I'm trying to say. Really what I'm trying to say is that if you have strong diagonals in your work you must think about it you must reconcile it it is going to be a completely dominant element and you might not even notice especially if you're working with a photo because you're going to be so busy you know kind of copying the photo elements onto your painting which is natural um, I'm always trying to encourage people not to do that one of the ways I didn't do that here was by changing the proportions of the various elements of the landscape and just pulling things from the photo to inform and give some realism now and I think I got actually for me it's quite a realistic little painting um, I like a dreamy quality um, but uh, this has that feeling um, but with you know some, some pretty good uh, realistic uh, rendering I will say yeah 
Um, oh, now that mass uh, in the background there. Let's talk about that. So, uh, you, you, hopefully, your um, your this is going to be uh, 1080 uh, for the non-members. For members, it's 4K, so you could really just fill up that whole monitor with it. You'll see that there's actually several different gradations there. I didn't just paint that all dark gray. I painted it dark gray and a portion, and then green in another portion. Then I started of bringing CAD red over in the leftmost portion of that darker rock shape there. And um, so you always want to be modulating, you always want to be changing things up. And it can be very subtle, it can be so subtle that people go, why are you bothering with that? But these these little decisions are what uh, distinguish the work of somebody who has mastery from somebody who's uh, struggling. And not to say that I don't struggle sometimes, but I definitely have more mastery, um, you know, several thousand paintings in or maybe it's a couple thousand I don't know I don't I haven't counted how many total paintings I've done but we're in the thousand mark and I was working with a student this week and we're doing a tree and uh, her tree looked awesome you know um, but she, she said oh, I like yours better and I said to her uh, I said well I've only painted a thousand more trees <laughs> so there, that's how you that's how you get mastery you know uh, do I have complete mastery? New way, especially, uh, um, you know, there's always another artist out there that's really killing it. And I don't worry too much about my contemporaries or peers. Um, I try to, uh, I try to uh, pull inspiration from the masters. If I worry about it at all, to be honest, I, I don't, unless I'm, I mean, I know I, uh, where, I, where I'm at and I know uh, where I can get better and uh, I'm always trying you know and the struggle is real yeah so another thing you might see me doing on this rocks down in the foreground is doing this like sort of connecting dark lines um, it was important when you have these isolated little shapes like that to try and connect them as much as possible like you have two rocks together and a little satellite also, I noticed there was like a pattern where these two, where you just saw me making a mark, surrounded by four rocks shapes that are all spaced the same. Um, you'll see me um, get in there and fix that. I caught that. Um, so you're looking for patterns, you're creating patterns. But the number one advice I have to you is that you come up with some initial ideas for various pattern or interpretation of the scene, and make make the focus of your painting. Um, refining that working on that more so than pulling things from the photo in especially details and things like that you now when i say details you could say well mike that's looking pretty detailed now but it's really it's actually more the impression of details informed by the reference than the actual details from the photo so that's a very important distinction and um, I'm always trying to impart this to you because if you can get this, um, your work will definitely benefit, uh, and you'll be able to use photos. A lot of a lot of the reason why people are into plein air is because outdoors is abs absolutely so overwhelming. They they're forced to simplify. Where the trap that's inherent with photos is you're dealing with two two dimensional reference. Um, you're creating a two dimensional painting and everything's been already made into a pattern that's flat um, so it's quite e quite a bit easier to just start copying all that over uh, don't do it just don't do it challenge yourself not to do it challenge yourself to um, to say I'm only gonna paint half the things in this photo into my painting and you know, it'll be your best painting yet I guarantee it and if you made it all the way to the 14 minute mark here God bless you uh, just a quick note I have um, I have received the books and I'm going to be doing a video um, I'm pretty sure I'm just going to mention it here for the the, the faithful um, uh, I'm pretty sure it's going to be $50 US because the shipping is pretty much uh, off the chart but the, I'll make a little bit there it'll help pay for the, the books were extremely expensive to print because I only did 50 books but um, my idea is to sell them and then print some more and uh, so look for that video. It's coming where I'll do a little walkthrough of the book. And if you've been waiting, it's it's a reality. It's actually going to happen. Anyway, that's it for this video. Um, until I come back with another video for your edification and enjoyment, do me a favor. Do me a solid. Take good care of yourself, your family, all your loved ones. 
stay out of trouble, and God bless you and your family.